OSPF uses fairly detailed background processes to build IP routes. In this video, I'll use a scenario and lots of show command output to help you learn about those background processes. This video is the third in a series of three related instructional videos. So in this video, we're going to talk about the show IP OSPF command and its many options at the end of the command. And those commands will tell you about the externals and internals of OSPF that you will have learned about in those first two instructional videos. So you're going to want to watch all three of those. Now, all three of those videos end with review videos that help you review and study the topics in those videos. So in this video, like always, if you stick around to the end of the video, you'll get some extras for exam prep. In particular, I'll talk about the most popular book and how to use that with this video. I'll talk about those review tasks, the one that's related to this video, and get you all set up and ready to go with that. And then I'll give you one extra, as usual, that's related to this video. In fact, this time we'll talk about some broken output in Cisco Packet Tracer that's different than what a real device would give you. Also, thanks for all the support that you folks have been giving me for this channel. You can do all the youtube -y things. All these things really do help. You don't have to do them all. Just pick one and do it. Also, if you're going to buy some learning products, if you'll start at that link and then buy something at Amazon or Cisco Press, I'll make a dollar or two there as well. All right. Thanks a bunch, folks. I appreciate the support. Let's jump into the video. For this video, we'll use this network. Each of the four routers has a WAN link to two other routers and a LAN link out to the side. They have these IP addresses as you see here. The IP addresses are configured and all the interfaces you see in the diagram are up and working. Then we'll have OSPF configured and all the links are placed into area zero. So it's a single area design with everybody in the backbone area. Given that OSPF should be up and working, and just so you know exactly the config behind the show commands, notice the four routers in their core config here. We've got router OSPF1 on all four routers. They've all got a router ID command, so we'll have nice recognizable router IDs for the show command output. And then, it's not obvious from the drawing necessarily, but this one command at the top, it's on all four routers. Now, this one command, let's take a look at it. The wildcard mask is all 255s meaning ignore all four quartets for matching with an address of 0000. This is the convention for configuring a match all interfaces bit of logic with an area zero at the end, meaning on each of the four routers, each router should match every interface no matter what its IP address is and enable OSPF in area zero. So I'll get some show command output from that network, like from router R1 here. And we can look at things like OSPF processes with these two commands, and we'll do that during this video. We can look at, quote, the enabled interfaces. That is, when the router looks at those network commands and decides which interfaces match that logic, we'll see those with these two commands. Then we also want to look at OSPF neighbors. In this case, each router should have two neighbor relationships. Well, we'll use these three commands that begin show IP OSPF neighbor. And even this command that begins show IP OSPF interface, it's got some interesting data about neighbors in there as well. Then we'll look at some internals like the OSPF database and rib with these two commands. And then finally, the IP routing table, the end result that we're looking for with a couple of variations that show us OSPF routes. When you're verifying or troubleshooting something with OSPF, you can start at either end of the problem. You can start with the config and work forward. You can start with the routing table and work backward. In this video, I'm starting with the routing table. So when you're thinking about routes that should appear in the IP routing table, think about how many subnets exist, what subnets do you expect to be in the routing table, which of those will be connected routes on a given router, which of those will be OSPF routes on a given router, if there are multiple possible routes to reach a subnet, which ones do you think will be the best route that the router will add to the routing table versus not based on the metric? So think about those things. In fact, if you want to look at this design again and think about the IP addresses and hit pause for a moment and think about that before I show you some output, feel free. Now's the time, but I'm going to keep going. 
So here we go. Show IP route, of course, is where you look to see the routes. So let's focus on the legend for just a moment. That's the part at the top, and it lists a bunch of codes. And the codes are one or two letters that will show up on the left that identifies each route's source. That is where the router learned that information or where it got the information from. So if there's an O in the far left, that means it's an OSPF learned route. And if it's also an enter area route, that is a route that's for a subnet that's in a different area than the local router is in, then it'll also show an IA beside the route as well. Now, in this design, it's a single area, so there's there's only one area, so there are no enter area routes, but that's what the code is for. You will see some connected and local routes in the output. You've learned about those before, and you'll see this heading line. The heading line always has a class A, B, or C network in it with the default mask, and it will tell you whether it's variably subnetted or not, almost always is this day and age, and it'll tell you how many subnets of that network this router knows about, and the number of masks in use. And this is the correct number for this design as per the drawings in this video. Let's take a deeper look. So now with this command's output, with the legend omitted because it doesn't all fit on one page, we see the re reference to 11 subnets up at the top. And if you counted them all, there's 11 subnets there. Now it turns out that three of them have L's in them. Those are the local routes for the specific IP addresses configured on each interface. There are three connected routes for the subnets on the interfaces on router R1. And then we've got these five subnets for OSPF learned routes as designated by the O's in the left-hand column. So those are our five OSPF learned routes. Now look just to the right of the five yellow highlights there. We see two numbers in brackets. For all the routing protocol learned routes, you'll see the two brackets. The first number is called administrative distance. The second is the metric. Routing protocols use metrics. But notice like the connected and local routes, they don't have the brackets. They don't have a metric assigned to them. It's not shown. They don't have one because they don't, the, the connected route and the local route ideas, there's no competition of possible multiple routes for, whether, for which there might be a need for a metric. So it's just with these routing protocol learned and added routes for which you would have a metric to deal with there. So what else do we have here? Well, let's just say you wanted to look at only OSPF routes. You could use this command, show IP route OSPF. It will show the legend. I've omitted it here for space, and it will have the same heading line it will even reference the fact of how many subnets the router knows about in that network, but it only lists the OSPF routes in the output, so you can focus on those. Something else you can do to verify OSPF is look at the link state database, but more importantly, really, is look at the neighbors. So for CCNA, especially, the neighbor detail is more important, but just a brief look at LSAs. Inside a single area design, you'll have a type one or router LSA, one for each router. And then for each link for which there are two or more routers for which a designated router is elected, a topic I haven't covered yet, there'll be a type two or network LSA created. So in this design, we'll have four of each. So knowing that, and especially after you learn a little more about designated routers, you'd say, hey, I expect to see four LSAs, type one router LSAs, because I've got four routers. So you could look at the router link states and see the link ID, and the link IDs are the router IDs. So if you know the router IDs should be 1111, 2222, 3333, etc., you should expect to see them there. And that's the easy part to figure out. Then for the type two network link states, I told you there'd be four. Well, here they are, and they have numbers to identify them, link IDs, and that's the IP address of the designated router that created the LSAs, and that's kind of beyond what we've already gotten to. So just trying to give you a feel for what you might expect to see there. So what OSPF on router R1 would do would be take this um, data and lots of detail behind these and crunch it with the SPF process to create those routes. 
Now, before R1 could learn those LSAs, it had to become neighbors with some other routers. So here's our basic topology with router R2 and R4 being neighbors. So these little blue lines with the circles I'm using to represent neighbor relationships. So R1 should have a neighbor relationship with both uh, R2 and R4, but not R3. So we could do a show command like show IP OSPF neighbor, which lists from R1's perspective, a neighbor relationship with R4, with its easy to remember neighbor router ID and with router R2. So just a few highlights there, we see that R4 was known or is known off of gigabit 001, as you see in the drawing. And R2 is known off gigabit 000, which is its upper interface in the drawing as well. Now, a lot of OSPF troubleshooting starts with neighbors, so I would suggest starting there if you know there are problems already. Uh, and the show IP OSPF neighbor command is probably the very first place to start, but you can use other variations on the theme like show IP OSPF neighbor and give it an interface ID. And that then limits the output to neighbors off of that one interface. For instance, in this case, it lists gigabit 000. It wouldn't list the neighbor relationship with router R4. And that interface shown in the output is the same one you use to limit the output in your show command as an example. You can also see a count of neighbors with this show IP OSPF interface, not show IP OSPF neighbor, but show IP OSPF interface brief command. So on each of the OSPF enabled interface, uh, interfaces off of router R1, you get some output. And on the far right, you get inbers, neighbors, and it's fully adjacent neighbors and a count of neighbors. And so off of the first interface, we get gig 002, that's the left-hand interface that's the LAN with no other neighbors, zero. But on the others, like on gig 000, we see one fully adjacent and total count of one. Now, I haven't told you what a fully adjacent neighbor is yet. That comes later with the designated router discussion, but that's a good place to look to see, hey, if I expect one neighbor, this second number after the slash ought to be a one. If I expect two, I ought to see a two, and so on. Now, if I want more detail about a neighbor, you just do show IP OSPF neighbor with the detail option. Then you get like a stanza like this for every neighbor. There's lots of information there. For instance, you get the area number. In this case, everyone's in area zero. You get the neighbor's router ID. You get a notation for how long your neighbor relationship has been up and some other details as well. Now you could always start with an analysis of your configuration and verifying that your configuration created the OSPF process and enabled OSPF on interfaces. So interfaces is a great place to look for that. And the show IP OSPF interface command with or without the brief option tells you that. With the brief option as seen here, it lists three interfaces in this case, the only three interfaces on the router. These lines don't show up unless you've enabled OSPF on the interface. You've enabled it. You enabled it under OSPF process ID 1. You've placed the interfaces in area 0 and so on. All right. We even have a neighbor count out here at the far right. We've seen this command before. So interfaces here are enabled for OSPF. Then if you leave off the brief option, you get you know 30 or so messages for each neighbor with lots and lots of detail. I'll leave it for you to read, but a few highlights, of course, you see the interface ID, you see the local routers, router ID there, and you see the cost, you see the neighbor count and adjacent neighbor count, the, the fully adjacent neighbor count up here. You see the designated routers, router ID, the backup designated routers, router ID topics that we haven't gotten to yet, and so on. So lots and lots of detail in here. Again, this interface doesn't show up unless OSPF is enabled on that interface. All right, so that's another check you can do. Now, if you're still just curious about your configuration, show IP protocols, not show IP OSPF, but show IP protocols is kind of an interesting bit of output. There's information there about all your routing protocols. And if you just care about OSPF, you can look at the section about OSPF. And in particular, 
it has this section labeled routing for networks. And then this line, get this. When you're using OSPF, if you configured the network command, everything after the network command here, iOS places in this section labeled routing for networks. So it's just a way to check what your configuration looks like say if you don't have access to the show running configuration command, like if it's on an exam or something, for instance. All right, so that's kind of a neat feature there. And then finally, the show IP OSPF command lists the OSPF process ID that you configured in your router OSPF1 command. It also lists the router ID if you want to verify that. Those of you that care about CCNA exam prep, you may be using the official CERT guides. If so, in the second edition, Volume 1, Part 6, Chapter 22, you'll find two major headings. The first of those, Implementing OSPF Using the Network Command, is where you'll find the same topics you find in this video. Now, about that section, I made three instructional videos here at YouTube for those. This video is the third of the three. So if you watch all three of these instructional videos, they're linked in the description, but if you watch all three, then yeah, you could safely skip reading that section and get a break from your reading. Go for it. There aren't any must-read topics that I'd want you to emphasize. Now, you can always benefit from also reading the book to get a second perspective on the same topics, but there's nothing you really ought to go read. If you want to be complete, you can go read the short topic, maybe a page, implementing multi-area OSPF. The study and review exercise to do now is an ad hoc lab. So what do I mean by that? I use the term ad hoc lab for a lab that's described in a video. There's no blog web page for it. So there's a video link up in the upper right hand corner. It's also in the description that points you to a video. When you open and watch that video, there's a lab intro that sets up the context and gives you instructions. Then the lab video says stop and do the lab. And then the second half of the video is a lab review and demo of the lab. Now to do the lab, you can do it in Cisco Packet Tracer. The Packet Tracer file is linked in the description of the lab video, not this video. Finally, there are a few issues with Packet Tracer with verification in OSPF. So here they are in a list. I'm going to tell you about these two bits of incorrect and missing information on the next slide with some sample output. So in the show IP protocols command, as shown here, it's taken from real gear. This highlighted section appears when you configure OSPF using interface subcommands. That's an alternative to using the network command. You can configure that in Packet Tracer, but this section of output that should appear does not in Packet Tracer. So just be warned if you go there. Second up, the show IP OSPF interface brief command around each interface lists a number of neighbors. Over on the right, notice these numbers are not zeros. In Packet Tracer, they're all zeros. It does not list the correct number of neighbors. So just be warned about the missing bit here and the incorrect numbers there. Hope you enjoyed this one. Lots of good information there. Practice this stuff. Get into lab. Try things. Even if you're relying on Packet Tracer, try it out. You can learn a lot from it. If you're new, please subscribe and click a bell so you're notified. Give me a like. That'll help drive that algorithm. It's always appreciated. Bye, y'all.